All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Skype a Scientist Live. My name is Sarah. I'm uh, the executive director of Skype a Scientist, and I run these live streams. And uh, today we are joined uh, by scientist, herpetology expert, uh, wonderful nature finder, um, nature photographer, science communicator, uh, Gina. Um, how do you say your last name, Gina? Zwicky. I exactly say it always works. myself. So however it gets out of your mouth is fine. Zwicky is phonetic. That's great. Um, all right. Well, we're really glad that you're here with us today. Uh, we're glad that all of you at home are here with us. Um, if you have any questions throughout the session, we are here to answer your questions. So use the Q&A function at the bottom. And as we go through the session, we will use the questions that you uh, provide. So we are really looking forward to hearing what you are curious about. Um, Dad, can we like just not do any like, uh, okay, thanks. My dad is here today uh, and we're doing some construction projects and I'm gonna ask him to not, uh, you know, hang shells for the next 40 minutes. Anyway, uh, we're really glad you're here. So um, Gina, would you like to introduce it yourself, say who you are, what you do and why you like it? Sure, my name is Gina Zwicky and I do have a very, very short slide deck if I can share my screen really quickly. Totally. And you should have that power. Here we go. Yeah. So I'm just going to leave it like this because I'm going to mess it up somehow if I go to full screen. All good. But anyway, I am a graduate student at the University of New Orleans. And the thesis that I'm working on is studying host parasite coevolution between a species of endemic island anole called Anola sabanus or the Saban anole from a really small island in the Lesser Antilles called Saba. They're super cute. Oh my gosh, look at him. He's so spotted, so dapper, beautiful. And they are sexually dimorphic, so the males look like this, females are a little bit more drab. Not a problem, still very fierce. But they have a really, really interesting system of host parasite coevolution with a plasmodium parasite, more commonly known as malaria, which is actually really common and widespread in birds, reptiles, etc., as well as humans in tropical areas of the planet. So what I actually look at is how these two species co-evolve at the genetic level in a family of immunity genes called the major histocompatibility complex in the anole. So I'm looking at basically patterns of shifts in the frequencies of these key immunity alleles over time and space on this small island. But in my free time, as you may know, if you're one of my social media buddies or Twitter followers, I really love frogs. I, I help run a program called Frog Watch USA which is a phenology program, which basically means monitoring changes in the activities of organisms throughout the year. So, you know, when do things become active in the spring? When do they sort of cease this activity in the fall? It's monitoring frog calling activity. So we take out a bunch of people out into the swamp at night and we listen for frogs. We record the frogs we hear, enter them into a database and this information can be used for species management, lots of different applications. I also really like mushrooms. Mushrooms are so cool. And these, so lizards, snakes, bugs of all kinds. I really just love being outside, be spending time in nature and sort of looking for the smaller stuff, the less charismatic megafauna type animals. I really enjoy sort of getting to know the things in my own backyard and when they're going to be active, where I might see them most frequently stuff like that. So I will stop sharing my screen and take any questions that you guys have. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that with us. I am also a big uh, small per small organism person. I love looking at the little stuff. So that's really, I'm with you. Um, so let's say you uh, have never really gone in your backyard before and you want to start like finding the nature that lives in your backyard, in your neighborhood. Um, what are the first things you do to try to find animals in your environment? So the classic and one that I think most people get started with is flipping rocks, flipping logs, which you have to be really careful with because you don't want to disturb the things that live under them. But it is a really great, reliable, accessible way to just, you know, flip over a rock, lots of cool bugs, kind of figure out how to identify different species just in this little microcosm. But it's also great to look at birds. They're very abundant, you know, easy to observe. But just making sure you're checking in the small places, you know, like in PVC piping, stuff like that under you know, the shed. So plenty of places to look in most people's local environments. Very cool. So how long have you been um, doing this project where you're listening for um, the frogs? So this is the second year. And unfortunately, we were shut down due to COVID restrictions for a couple of months. But 
we're back in full force and it's getting warm here. I live in New Orleans and that's where the program, at least this branch of it is running. So lots going on already, we're really excited. Awesome, so we have a class here from Louisiana. Um, is there a way for folks that are local to you to get involved with you? Yes, actually I would be happy to have my email distributed. It's a public email, you can get on the mailing list and then you'll get an update every time there's going to be a trip. And cool. yeah, they're pretty regular. It's once every two weeks at the minimum, but sometimes if I'm just you know extra excited about frogs, I'll, I'll run different extra ones, so. Awesome. So what kind of um, species of frog are you listening for? Are you monitoring? So there are a lot of different species that we can find in the park where I personally run the hikes, which is the Jean Lafitte Barataria Preserve right outside of metropolitan New Orleans. And we most frequently hear at this time of year, spring peepers, green tree frogs, squirrel tree frogs. I'm just, I'm just going to go as many as I can. Uh, we get Fortunately, no Cuban tree frogs in the park yet, although they are in the city, they're an invasive species, but we get Gulf Coast toads, um, we get pig frogs, green frogs, pig bullfrogs. Pig, oh my gosh, okay, pig frogs. I'm gonna put myself out there and just imitate the call. Like they literally just go like, Burr, like they sound like a pig. <laughs> it's honestly kind of freaky because there are feral hogs in this part of the country. So I, I hear a pig frog, I'm like, <laughs> I have one hand on the tree, I'm like ready to go up because feral pigs are scary, but. Anyway, lots of different frogs with very recognizable calls. So what I do at the beginning of these trips is I'll play them all just from my phone. Just a little example of, you know, here's what this species sounds like. Let me know if you hear it. Let me know how many you hear. And we'll write down the calling intensity, species we hear, stuff like that. Very cool. I love that. We have one, so I live in Philadelphia and uh, the closest tree frog we have here for anybody who's in New York and the Jersey area, we've got one tree frog and they live in the Pine Barrens. And I have tried to find that frog and I can't do it to save my life. So one of these days, I'm going to find that. Well, if it makes you feel any better, I grew up in Philly and I could never find one either. <laughs> so oh, good. No, that does make me feel better. I yeah. feel like you are great at finding frogs. I'm always so jealous of all the uh, people in the South on Twitter who are posting these cute little frogs on their cars and everything. Very exciting. Oh yeah. You can't throw a rock without you know seeing a frog. Uh, it really is not super fair to the Northeastern friends, but no. Oh. Well, that's exciting. Um, Mr. Blankney, uh, Blackney would like to know, uh, how do we get to go on a frog listening trip? So you basically, if you're local, can contact me directly. But if you're not, there are tons of branches of Frog Watch USA. It's a community science program that's part of the AZA, or the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, and they have branches all over the country. So if you're not local, there is a pretty good chance that you'll have a branch near you that you can actually attend. So if you go on the AZA's website, they have a Frog Watch information page that can help you actually find the branch that's local to you so you can attend. Very cool. Um, Saya would like to know, what's your favorite type of frog or the favorite one that you have studied? Oh my gosh, okay. Um, I've only studied one species of frog technically. As an undergraduate, I worked on a project with cricket frogs. So Acris crepitans, which is a local species and the project was related to amphibian disease. So we were studying the interactions between them and chytrid fungus. So they're really cute. I love cricket frogs, but I think my favorite frog of all time, oh, I answer this question all the time and my answer changes, <laughs> but today it's gonna be the Wallace's flying frog which actually has really, really big pads or between its toes that can allow it to glide when it jumps. That's so cool. it doesn't have powered flight, but it technically can fly a little bit between treetops, et cetera. It's really cool. We'd love to see this in the wild someday. So if you're accessing Google right now, make sure you Google frog because it's just, oh my God, they're so cute. That's <laughs> awesome. Um, Mrs. Young's fourth and fifth grade class is here. Um, and Rayanne would like to know, uh, what is your study with frogs or your, your lizards for your grad school work um, hoping to prove or learn about? That's a great question. So what we are doing is basically trying to figure out why this family of immune genes that I study is so variable. Because the MHC or the major histocompatibility complex is actually one of the most, if not the most variable gene regions in vertebrates. So if it's that variable, there has to be a reason why. And there are a few different hypotheses or ideas about why this may be. So we're basically trying to figure out the specific dynamics that drive this variability. So my project is looking at whether this amount of variation is basically to ensure that there's a pool of genes from which you know evolution can choose as to say um, to be most effective in different parts of space and time. So say one year, malaria pressure selects for a certain group of alleles to be more effective in 
preventing serious disease and protecting the lizards, but another year it might be a different set of genes. So you still have all this kind of background variability there to choose from again. So that's what we're hoping to find out. Very cool. Do humans have uh, MHC proteins? They do. It's a really interesting study of, uh, or area rather, of medical research. So yeah, okay. yeah, I use a lot of medical databases for my for my project. It's fun. Awesome. Uh, when you get to be at the age where like proteins um, are coming into your uh, school work, um, MHC proteins are, in my opinion, some of the coolest things out there. I studied uh, squid immunology during uh, my PhD and uh, they don't have anything that complicated, um, or at least that we know of yet. Um, and so MHCs were always one of my favorites. Um, Aya would like to know, at what age did you realize that you could turn your love of frogs, bugs, and critters into a career? I was sort of flying by the seat of my pants hoping I could. Uh, <laughs> from yeah. a very, very young age, I think this is common to a lot of people who love animals, but I was definitely the kid who would just have handfuls of bugs and worms and spiders and carry them into the kitchen and drop them on the floor for my mom to enjoy. So <laughs> I've been like this forever, kind of cut my teeth on, you know, Steve Irwin, Jeff Corwin, and The Most Extreme, which is the best TV show of all time, in my opinion. But I think it was probably in high school during my AP biology class that I really realized the ways specifically that I could try to turn this into a career. So from there, I started looking into colleges that had good biology programs, that could help me develop a research career. So yeah, probably mid to late high school was when I really decided that it would be a career instead of just an interest. Very cool. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about that pictrid fungus that you mentioned? What is it? Why is it affecting frogs, um, et cetera? Sure, so chytrid fungus sadly is one of the most devastating pandemics because we all need you know more of that in our lives of all time, and they have caused catastrophic declines in populations of amphibian species on a global scale. So it's been many, many, many decades that researchers have been noticing these declines, but only in the past few decades that we realized the driver behind them was this disease called chytridiomycosis. So chytridio, the prefix referring to the specific fungus, and mycosis, the suffix referring to a fungal disease. So myco, mycology, you know, but it can cause all kinds of symptoms in amphibians. One of them is called the loss of writing reflex. So that means if you flip the frog on its back, it actually cannot flip back over. Huh. And it can cause a lot of issues with their skin, which is a huge problem because amphibians have porous skin that functions for respiration, you know, water transfer. So anything going on with this like skin barrier can be a huge deal for their survival. So several species, upwards of 10 to 15 that I know of offhand in Central America and South America have been declared extinct almost as a direct result of chytrid fungus. Notably, the Panamanian golden frog, actually kind of toad, but uh, they're extinct in the wild. So there's a lot of research going on about how to successfully protect these amphibian populations because once chytrid fungus is in the environment, there's no taking it out. So the research is sort of focusing on stuff like skin microbiomes or, you know, the bacterial communities that actually live on the amphibian skin that might help them modulate these responses to pathogen challenges. So the fungus, uh, lots of different areas of research going on, but it's all really interesting applied conservation science. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Mrs. Barnes's third graders want to know, do you have any reptiles as pets? I do. Uh, they're I can't see them from here with the camera, but I have three snakes and I have one tortoise named Meatball. She's so cute. Uh, but I have a green tree python, an Amazon tree boa, and a ball python. And they're like three feet away from me, but unfortunately not visible. Oh man, uh, the tree boas are so gorgeous. Um, I also have a ball python. Um, oh yeah. Snakes make better pets uh, than people realize, I think. Uh, they're, they're pretty good in my opinion. Okay, um, Jennifer Jeffers asks, how do frogs benefit the environment? So that's a great question. Uh, they're both predators and prey, you know, being small but voracious little animals. So they play an important role in food webs. So, you know, the loss of frogs can cause anything that feeds on frogs to run into challenges surviving. So snakes, you know, these larger meso predators, uh, removing any species from the food web can have sort of a cascade of effects. So. They are also what's called an indicator species, which doesn't really play into their importance in the environment, but it is more of a function of how sensitive they are to stuff like pollution, uh, habitat loss, et cetera. So when the frogs start having problems, it's an early warning sign that there are problems in the ecosystem. 
for sure. Um, Jenny would like to know, what is the difference between a frog and a toad? So toads are actually just a kind of frog. Uh, a lot of them are interchangeably referred to with their common names, but it's sort of like the rectangle and square thing. So you know how all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. Same thing with frogs and toads. Very cool. Um, Josephine asks, what advice would you give to students who want to study science or have a career in science in the future? I think that personally, my best advice would be to find a good mentor, a good champion who's already in the field because there are a lot of unfortunately unwritten rules about how to get your foot in the door with internships, research positions in college, stuff like that. So having somebody in your corner who's already been through it all is a really invaluable resource and they can give you a lot better, more specific information than you might be able to find on Google. Awesome, great advice. Um, Razvan wants to know, can frogs be invasive species? They can, and this is actually very relevant to where I live in New Orleans. Frogs can be extremely invasive, and some of the traits that make a good invader are sort of a broad range of habitat tolerance. So, you know, you can tolerate a wide variety of temperatures, tolerate human disturbed habitat, stuff like that. And one particular species that's of concern locally is the Cuban tree frog. And they are huge. They're about, you know, three or four inches long. They're much bigger than all of the other local tree frogs. But Frogs of all species basically will eat whatever they can fit in their mouths that's moving. So locally that involves or includes all the other tree frogs. So oh no. yeah, Cuban tree frogs are voracious predators that have been having impacts on local amphibian populations. So yes, they definitely can be. Oh boy, all right. Um, let's see, Jenny wants to know what's the smallest and biggest type of frog? That's actually a good question. I don't know off the top of my head the smallest frog. I know how big it is, but I forget what it's called. It fits about just on your fingernail. But the biggest frog, I will wager to say it's probably the African bullfrog, at least just off offhand. They're humongous, like upwards of 10 pounds. Big, big cheeseburger of a frog. So they're really cool though. Yeah, definitely look those frogs up there. Mm -hmm. Honking, they're really big. <laughs> um, Ella asks, what is your favorite place you have visited to study animals? So I think my favorite place was Panama. I was working on a bird project actually with one of my mentors at Tulane University, which is where I did my undergraduate education. But I was a field assistant for the summer in Panama and we were working in actually cow pastures <laughs> to, to look for these wading birds. So it wasn't exactly like rainforest research, what you might think of when you think of you know Panama, Central America, but it was really, really cool. We were doing something called mist netting which is how you capture birds for research if you need something like blood samples or you're trying to band them. So you put up these really transparent nets and the birds will fly into them. You can remove them, get the data you need and let them go. But it involves lots of birds in your hand, you know, really cool up close research. So it was really fascinating, it was beautiful. That's amazing. Um, Tyler asks, what's the hardest part about your studies? Oh, I think it's probably just all the little weird stuff that can happen in the lab that's not really under your control. So a lot of my research involves what's called PCR or polymerase chain reaction, which is basically when you take a little bit of DNA and you turn it through a, ser a series of chemical reactions into a lot of DNA that you can actually sequence and get a lot more information from. But these PCRs can become contaminated with a variety of things, you know, dust, DNA, ghosts is what we, we usually <laughs> say in the lab, there's, there's a ghost in the cycler. So contamination is a huge problem for a lot of people who work with the genome. Uh, freezer issues, uh, a lot of just minor lab inconveniences, but you know, it's sort of the, the flip side. We get to do the fun field work. We have to deal with all the horrible <laughs> lab mishaps. Yeah, for sure. Um, both Sabrina and Erica, and perhaps others on this list are asking, um, let's see, Mrs. Martin's fifth grade scholars are happy to be here. We're wondering if there are any poisonous frogs. There are lots of poisonous frogs. That's a great question. So two general groups of frogs that come to mind are the poison dart frogs from the neotropics or the new world tropics, central South America and mantellas, which are from Eastern Africa, Madagascar, et cetera. And both of them are highly toxic in their natural environments, but generally in captivity, not so toxic. So that's because oh. this is a result of what they eat in the wild. Cool toxins and use the toxins from their prey to protect themselves, which is really, really interesting. So frogs born and raised in captivity will actually be pretty safe to handle. 
very cool. Um, Mrs. Barnes's third graders would like to know, do frogs hibernate? So a lot of frogs do actually, um, you know, anything that's that small and living at the higher latitude. So in, you know, the north, northeast will hibernate. And there's a species called wood frogs that are really fascinating because they, they can actually basically freeze solid. And they have a sort of antifreeze chemical in their tissues that prevents the cell damage, but they can literally be little ice cube block frogs and then <laughs> thaw in the summer. It's super cool. Yeah. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. The things that animals can do, like the <laughs> deeper you go into biology, the more wild things you find out that animals can do. That's amazing. Um, Mrs. Young's fourth and fifth grade class want to know, uh, this is from Aiden. Um, are there any invasive toads in the U.S. that are similar to Australia's cane toads? There actually are. I think cane toads in the U.S. I know they're in Central America. I think they might be in Florida. I'm not. And they're in sure. Hawaii for sure. Are they? Hawaii, yeah. yeah. Oh no, but yeah, cane toads are uh, an interesting story about biocontrol gone wrong. So where they're introduced, it's because cane toads are humongous. You know, they're another really, really big, big honking toad. Wow. Yeah. And they were introduced, I believe, as an, a measure against parasites of uh, sugar cane. So hence the name cane toad. Uh, I can't remember if it was that crop in, in the new world where they were introduced, but uh, they don't actually do that well <laughs> at controlling the, the pests they were brought here to control because they're short and they can't really hop and actually access these bugs that are the problem. Uh, so they just eat everything that's on the ground, become a huge nuisance for, for vehicle traffic. <laughs> uh, they're poisonous and dogs, if they you know get their mouths on them, it can be a big problem. So yes, there are cane toads in the US, confirmed in Hawaii, I think in Florida. Very cool. Well, very bad, really, but yeah, they are I, cool. I, I can't help myself, you know. They're still a little bit cool. I so I was on a night hike um, in Hawaii, and like when the sunset, just like reptile life came out of the woodwork. Like there were um, geckos that came out, and then cane. I mean, there were cane toads everywhere, and I didn't know <laughs> at the time. Um, don't if there's one thing, remember this kids at home. Um, I didn't know that their skin could secrete like poisonous stuff. So I just like scooped one up and was like, saying, hello, sir. And then like, put it back. Um, and I didn't get poisoned. It was fine. But later I was like, I shouldn't have done that. Um, so when you, when you see an animal in the wild, don't um, assume it's chill and pick it up. Uh, like I sometimes have in the past. Shouldn't have done that. Good to know. Did the same thing with one of those uh, in like extremely toxic newts from the Pacific Northwest. I have a picture of myself from like five years ago holding this newt. I was like, oh, how cute, which I don't hold amphibians anymore. You know, yeah, I, we I shouldn't hold had, amphibians. Yeah, did growth on that subject. But uh, it's one of the most toxic vertebrates in the world. Uh, can right. definitely kill an adult human by eating them. So don't don't yeah. touch the newts if you find them. Yeah. yeah. Also, don't touch amphibians because uh, as Gina was talking about, they have really poor skin. So if you have bug spray on, if you have even like moisturizer or sunscreen or like any of the stuff that we have on our hands just gets like sucked up into their little bodies and it's really not good for them. So just look at them and say, hello, so nice to see you. And then don't pick them up as much as I understand that you want to just like go home and hug your cat. It, it's tough, but we gotta respect their little, little skin bodies. Um, Mia would like to know, can some frogs camouflage? So many frogs do actually, especially local frogs. So two main kind of determinants for how their bodies will be colored come to mind. One of them is camouflage. So trying to blend in with their surroundings. Most of the local frogs are either green or brown. A lot of the tree frogs are green. So they sort of hide in the little palmetto leaves or in green foliage. The frogs that you'll find closer to the ground are mostly brown or brownish green. So that's camouflage. But another thing, uh, the reason why you'll see a lot of frogs, especially in the tropics, be very colorful is something called aposematism. So that basically is a way of advertising to predators, I'm poisonous or I taste bad, don't eat me. So right. the bright colors do make them more visible, but it has that dual function as a warning for an anti-predator measure. So it doesn't actually influence their survival negatively. Awesome, very cool. There's just one frog, do you know what it's called? It, it's gorgeous and it looks just like a pile of moss, like it's um, speckled green and black. I do. It's the Vietnamese mossy frog. That might be what you're thinking of. And this everybody is a, Google it. Uh, oh, they're so cute. They're gorgeous. <laughs> it's an interesting example of uh, convergent evolution too, because the Vietnamese mossy frog has, I think, six species from around the planet that look almost identical. Whoa. So they've converged, or you know, 
kind of evolved towards the same type of camouflage to just look like a clump of moss and lichen. But they're really fascinating. And the textured skin, like Sarah was mentioning, is really, really beautiful. Amazing. Amazing. Um, Sabrina and Ryan asked, what is the weirdest frog you've ever seen? Oh, great question. I think it's got to be the Suriname toad. So this is not for those who are squeamish or have trypophobia, don't like to see, you know, like nasty little skin holes. But Suriname toads have a really, really interesting brooding method where they actually have their eggs laid on the backs of the adults and skin grows over the eggs to protect them while they're sort of developing. And then the babies actually hatch directly out of the adult's body through the skin. So if you okay. want to Google it, it's super cool, but it's very gross. So yeah, that's, that's probably it. Yeah, it's grody, but awesome. Um, Dahi would like to know uh, how and where do frogs lay eggs? So frogs lay eggs pretty much exclusively in the water. So that's why, you know, being amphibians, they need to be close to the water. Their eggs do not have shells. They kind of look like a just blob of jelly and they develop directly in the water. So some frogs that live in rainforest habitats lay their eggs in plants that have like little cups of water rather than an actual moving streams of water, et cetera. But yeah, that's the, the typical method for egg laying frogs. Very cool. Um, Jenny uh, and Kaylee are both asked similar questions. Um, what are some of the sounds that frogs make? Okay, I love to imitate these for the people that, that come on my hikes. Uh, just a dazzling variety of sounds. So the more variety, the better, because the point of these calls is to attract mates. So that's pretty much the exclusive reason why frogs make noises. So if you're trying to find somebody of your own species, you want the call to sound different from all the other calls. So that's why you hear such a huge variety of, you know, these different types of frog calls. Awesome. Um, Xavier asks, are there frogs in Canada? Yes, there are. Um, I can't say that I know a lot about the specific types of frogs that live in Canada, but yes, there are. Very cool. Um, about how many types of frogs exist in the world? Hundreds of species. Uh, that's about as far as I can get uh, off yeah. the top of my head. But there are also probably a lot of species yet to be described, especially in tropical areas. So probably more frogs than, than we think so far is the answer to that. Yeah, but in, in the unfortunately, like kind of shrinking all the time because chytrid mm -hmm. is kind of threatening their existence, which is very sad. Very yeah. really sad. Um, let's see. Uh, Ethan asks, "Do you know anything about amphibious lizards, like salamanders or newts?" So salamanders are actually not lizards; they are also amphibians, like frogs, and they do look like lizards. You know, they've got their little four legs and their tails, but they are not. They are much more closely related to frogs. Uh, but yeah, um, there are a lot of lizards that do spend time in water, like monitor lizards of Southeast Asia come to mind. Um, alligators and crocodiles are not lizards, actually. A lot of people are surprised to find that out. But um, yeah, there's marine iguanas in the Galapagos. Uh, I've even seen anoles around here. So the little, you know, little guys swimming when they have to. Wow, cool. Um, those uh, marine iguanas are one of my favorites. They I just will. are so Godzilla and I, and I love that. Um, uh, Mrs. Blackney wants to know, uh, what made you choose to come to Louisiana for your degrees? So I had always dreamed of just being in a place where lizards were everywhere, you know, reptiles, frogs, et cetera, are much, much, much more common here than where I grew up. I actually did grow up in Philadelphia and you, you can see some wildlife around there, but it's a lot more in your face here. So I came down here to visit, uh, Tulane University when I heard I had gotten in and I went to the park right across the street from the school and there was just like a million lizards like crawling over my feet and I was like all right all right I don't need, I don't care about the school whatever there's lizards here let's go so I wouldn't say that was the most informed <laughs> decision I've ever made but it certainly worked out for me I had a great experience awesome yeah I visited um University of Louisiana and I there's just an alligator like on campus and just like yep. there's like three of them they just live on campus and that's just like, that's just Tuesday at mm -hmm. University of Louisiana. And um, I love it. My uh, fiance went there and he said uh, his favorite story to tell is that when it rained really, really heavily, the gators would get out of the swamp that's in the center of the, cam uh, the campus at UL and security would have to come with a stick and just like shush them back into the water. <laughs> so God. yeah, normal day in Louisiana. I love that, I love that. Mm -hmm. Gators are so, so, so cool. Um, let's see. 
Sorry, there's a lot of uh, repetitive questions in here. I'm trying to uh, push through. What has been your favorite part about your study so far? So I think it's really, really cool that I've gotten to know so much about the molecular methods used to protect and study wildlife. So a lot of people, when they think about having a career in conservation biology, think about being out in the field, you know, tropical habitats, hanging out with lots of animals. But the majority of the work you actually do, as I kind of touched on earlier, is back in the lab using stuff like pipettes and, you know, tubes of DNA. And I just think it's super, super interesting to learn more about the actual nuts and bolts of what creates animals. You know, the genetic code, how we can sequence it, how we can study it, how it changes over time. I think it was really cool because that's not something I really came in expecting to be so interested in and fascinated by. Very cool. Yeah. Um, you never know when when you're a kid, like you think you're just going to be working with animals broadly, or at least that's what I thought. I shouldn't say all kids think that. That's what I thought as a kid. And then um, I ended up doing like a lot of work with microscopes and bacteria that live with the animals. And you never know, like science is so broad and there are so many questions to ask that you never know where you're going to end up. So I had this, a similar experience. Um, Mary would like to know, do you ban frogs like people do with birds? So that's a good question. We do not. So typically, if you want to do what's called a mark recapture study, which means you collect the animal and then you mark it in a way that you'll know whether or not you've collected this animal before and then release it, you know, maybe you'll find it again, is a toe clip. So sounds a little barbaric, but there aren't really very many better options. So a lot of amphibians can actually regrow these tissues, so it doesn't <laughs> apply to, to all of them, but a little toe clip is a convenient way to get DNA from a frog without being super invasive and to also know whether or not you've sampled from this particular frog before if you're visiting the same sample sites over and over again. Very cool. Um, Maya asks, what's the best time in an environment to go searching for frogs? So the best environment is anywhere that you're near water. So wetlands, riverbanks, stuff like that. I mean, there are also lots of frogs that live in woodland environments, but most commonly I see them very, very close to the water. And the time when they're going to be most active is at dusk. So usually late, late at night, they're not very active. And during the day, there are a few species that you'll hear calling, but the dusk hours right, you know, around like seven to nine are really popping for frog activity. So that's the best time to go. Very cool. I'll try again this summer with that darn tree frog uh, in, in the Pine Barrens. Um, Adriani would like to know how big can an iguana grow? Okay, iguanas get humongous. Um, and any Floridians I'm sure are familiar, but iguanas can get, including tail, about five, six feet long at the maximum, which might be a, a bit of an overstatement on my part, but not by a lot, <laughs> if a it lot. is. Yeah. They get huge, yeah. They really do. I was, one time I was in the Florida Keys and I, I also love lizards, but come live in places where there aren't a lot of lizards. And they were all, all the lizards or the iguanas specifically were lined up against, like on the side of the highway and like the grass. And I pulled over just because I wanted to like get a closer look at them and try to catch one. Um, which shouldn't be, I shouldn't say that. I, you don't catch lizards, but I wanted to look at them close up and I was chasing them and the big ones like pick up their little hands and run on their back legs. And it was the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life. I was like cracking up by myself on the side of the highway watching these iguanas. Uh, but anyway, let's get back to children's questions. Um, what, this is from Karen. What is, this is a, a tough question. What's your least favorite frog? My least favorite frog. It's actually not a tough question for me because it's got to be the Cuban tree frog, invasive oh, frogs, you know, which is hard to say because they're so cute. They've just got these little gumball toes. Oh my gosh, like they're adorable. But just seeing firsthand the damage that they do to local ecosystems makes them, I think, my least favorite frog. Yeah, that's that's a good good answer. Um, why are frogs? This is from Dai. Why are so why are frogs so sensitive to pollution? So frogs are really sensitive to pollution because we touched on a little earlier, they have really, really porous skin. So anything that touches their skin is basically absorbed into their body. So if there are toxins in the water, contaminants from, you know, street runoff, stuff like that, it can hugely damage the frog and can basically poison them from the outside in. Yeah, it's really sad. Um, Mrs. Young's fourth and fifth grade class wants to know, um, do both male and female frogs croak or is it just one of the two? Typically, it is just the male frogs. I actually can't can't say that I know exclusively if there are no female frogs that call, but yeah, it's typically male frogs that call. Very cool. 
Sorry, um, my cat has found a bug and she's <laughs> losing her mind behind me here. So if that's distracting, that's gotta, I apologize. Be cats. I get it. I get it. <laughs> um, I have three cats in the house and they never behave. So I get it. Um, Aiden would like to know, how are amphibians able to secrete toxins without poisoning themselves? Do they have special tissues um, or organelles to deal with this problem? That's, so that's awesome a great question. question. Yeah. I actually don't know the specific mechanism by which they are resistant to their own toxins, but given that most of the toxins that they secrete are toxic upon ingestion, I would maybe at least chance to say that they're not ingesting them, just secreting right. them, and that that might be a potential mechanism, but I'll have to look more into that. It's a great question. That's an awesome question. I don't know the answer either. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, we recently, this is from Ray. Um, we have recently learned about fungus that can neurologically control their hosts. That means like their brains get altered. Um, are there any fungi that can infect amphibians the same way? So I hope not. <laughs> they have enough problems. You know, I assume we're talking about cordyceps, which is really fascinating. Another sort of niche interest of mine. And for anybody who's listening and isn't aware, what cordyceps actually does to its invertebrate hosts is kind of neurologically compel them to go to a high point and they'll stand up here with their little like zombie mushroom coming out of their head and that's for spore dispersal so the, the fungus wants them to you know go where they're going to be able to disperse the spores by wind but although chytra does affect the behavior of amphibians it's due to the symptoms that it creates rather than actual neurological control so not that i know of never say never <laughs> you know evolution's a funny okay. thing but yeah not not as far as we know now Cool. And if you are interested in that topic, the cordyceps, the, the zombie ants, um, we just had a session on that in, I think, February 5th. So if you go to youtube.com slash Skype a scientist, you can watch that whole session if you didn't catch it. It was a fun one for sure. Um, let's see. Uh, RC would like to know, are there any amphibians that are keystone species or are all of them canaries in a coal mine? I don't know of any off the top of my head that are keystone species. And for those who are not familiar with the term, a keystone species is one for whom the amount of biomass that it creates in the system is way less than its actual proportional impact on the system. So one good example of this would be the gopher tortoises, which are also a local species. And the reason they're a keystone species is because even though there aren't very many of them, they dig these really long burrows that create habitat for tons of other species. So the loss of gopher tortoises actually impacts the other species that depend on them to be habitat architects that create these burrows. So that's sort of what a keystone species is where uh, I think the sea, uh, sea otters are also another good example up in the Pacific Northwest where they eat sea urchins. And when the sea otters are gone, the sea urchins explode in population, destroy kelp forests. So that's sort of the general concept. I don't know of any amphibians that I would say function as a keystone species, but that's a great question. And I'll definitely be looking more into that as well. Y'all are impressing me. These questions are always so good. So good and so numerous, it's really wonderful. Um, so the next question uh, is, is your job ever dangerous? Like you're working in Jean Lafitte, which is like lots of gators there. Like is, is your job, and you live in Louisiana where there's lots of uh, hurricanes. Like, is there any part of your job where you find yourself in danger? So that is a pretty common question that I get. And the answer in short is yes, but a lot of the danger can be mitigated just through common sense practices. Yeah. So we do go out into the swamp at night for frog watch, but we are on a boardwalk. So we're actually <laughs> elevated above the swamps. So if we're running into any wildlife, we're not directly in contact with it. So we wouldn't bring volunteers out into a, an area that was dangerous for them to be. But I have done some work uh, with mist netting um, in Central America where I was waist deep in water with lots and lots of crocodiles and caimans that I didn't know about. So uh, there were people stopping and like honking their car horns and be like, what are you doing in there? I was like, I'm, I'm working. And then just drive away, like shaking their heads at me. And I had no idea what they were talking about. And then I get up and I see like a hundred feet to my right, there's just like a seven foot long crocodile. I'm just like, all right, all right, you know, but so yeah, a lot of these things are solved by just having more common sense than I did that day and not putting yourself in harm's way with potentially dangerous wildlife. Because yeah, no wildlife I mean, is dangerous if you leave it alone. That's very true. Um, and hopefully if you have a good boss or advisor, they will protect you and make sure that you're not going into dangerous areas. So um, yeah, I don't know. 
it sometimes feels worth commuting for us, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, Jennifer would like to know, uh, what is your least favorite part of your job? I feel like a lot of us would agree that it's the the desk biology that we do. So, you know, on the off seasons when you're not out in the field, it can get a little tedious to be stuck in the lab, you know, just tick -tock, tick -tock on your computer for hours a day. So that's probably my least favorite part, but there's still plenty of value to be found in, you know, the skills you'll gain by doing that and things you'll learn that you really couldn't get on the field, so. Awesome. And Ella wants to know on the flip side, what's been your favorite moment in your job? Oh, okay. I have had a lot of different field jobs, so I'll just talk about one specifically. Right after I finished with my undergraduate work, so my just basic college, I was a fisheries observer for a year up in the Pacific Northwest, which was a ton of fun. It's basically where you go as an impartial observer on fishing vessels. So you're keeping track of what they're catching that they actually discard. So stuff that they're not going to, you know, put into the market as seafood, but still gets caught by these trawl nets going through and just identifying species, monitoring any sort of interactions with protected species. So like whales, dolphins, sea lions and stuff like that, which is super cool. That was probably my favorite field job that I've ever had. It was really fascinating. And just being out at sea for weeks at a time is an experience that few get to have and that I really treasured. That's awesome. That's a really, uh, tough job that's really really cool that you have that experience yeah very smelly uh, job i still have like shrimp hairs in my car and stuff but <laughs> it was worth it yeah. i relate i relate uh for sure um mrs coiner's class wants to know what advice or guidance would you give high school biology students of how to engage with work like yours remotely so remotely i'm gonna assume just meaning right now you know during yeah lockdown stuff like that i would say it's kind of just back to the same answer I gave before, find local mentors who can, you know, you can get your foot in the door with local programs. So there are lots and lots of community science programs all over the country that are still accessible right now. But as far as remotely, just sort of plugging into people who work in the fields that you're interested in, seeing what they have to say, um, getting advice directly from people who do what you want to do is probably the best way to engage remotely. For sure. I'll also add to that. Um, so this is specifically for the teachers and educators and parents probably in the audience. Um, we're going to do a session in, on March 20th that's um, about uh, a community science platform called Zooniverse. If you want to go um, to that, it's at 1 p.m. on the 20th, which is a Saturday. Um, you can learn how you can use that program in your classrooms um, or at home. It's basically um, an online platform where you can contribute to community science projects of all different kinds, everything from like space to protein folding, like all sorts of stuff. So definitely come check that out. Um, also, you can just look up Zooniverse. It's like universe with a zoo instead of a U. Um, and also uh, the next question is Maya, um, and I'm gonna type this out. Uh, so when you tell it to me, I will type it. What's the website to find frog listening trips in our area? Like what should people look at? So I, off the top of my head, I think it's aza.org slash frog watch. But if they and, like Google frog watch, do you think they'll yeah. find something? Yeah, okay. just Google frog watch USA. It'll take you right to the informational page. Frog watch USA, love it. I'm gonna look that up, that sounds fun. Um, okay, awesome. So we try to keep this to 45 minutes and we still have a hundred questions here. Um, so uh, we're gonna wrap it up because we have to keep it on time. So we always ask everybody the same two questions at the end of every session. And the first question is, if you had the attention of everyone in the whole world and you could tell them one thing about your area of study, what would it be? Oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> wow. All right, this is every scientist's challenge is how to give their little elevator pitch. But um, yeah. I would say if they could take away one thing from my specific area of research, so stepping away from the frog watch stuff, it would be that coevolution between hosts and parasites is one of the most interesting forms of evolution. There's something called the Red Queen hypothesis, which basically is drawing from Alice in Wonderland, so the Red Queen saying that it takes all the running you can do just to stay in the same place. And that basically means, all right, well, the host evolves, you know, a special kind of resistance against the parasite. So the parasite just one-ups them back and evolves a different way to be a better parasite. And this goes on and on and on perpetually through time on an evolutionary level and is the cause behind so many of the interesting adaptations we see. So these really dazzling anti-predator defenses, you know, 
bombardier beetles that shoot acid out of their butts, stuff like that, you know, wouldn't exist without coevolution between predator and prey, host and parasites. It's really, really cool. Amazing. Great. Okay. Second question. You still have everyone's attention in the whole world and you can tell them one thing about literally anything. It can be as big picture important or silly and insignificant as you'd like. What do you tell them? Okay. So we did talk a little bit about this, but it's something that I think is just becoming more of a, an issue in the public awareness is handling the animals that we find just on our walks and, you know, little expeditions. So a lot of people have had their first experiences with nature by picking stuff up, you know, like picking up a snake, picking up a frog and checking it out. It's so cool. And that's great. And I don't want to discredit that, but the more time passes, the more researchers sort of realize that the best way to appreciate these animals and to be a friend to frogs per se is to leave them alone, you know, observe them up close. You can take great pictures, but don't touch them. Don't bother them because at the end of the day, we want to, you know, check them out and investigate them because we like them. And the best way to like them is to respect their space, protect them, keep your hands off. Yeah. And one thing that I've personally done in the last couple of years to like help not touch things is, is get into photography. And, and Gina, you do this as well. Like I um, got into like macro photography. So one of the reasons that I want to pick things up um, is that I want to bring them right up to my face so I can see the detail and macro photography. Uh, I know not everybody can afford it, but like you can also just use your phone or whatever to zoom in and stuff. Like you can see the detail of the animal and like really get a sense for what the animal's life is like without manhandling it. And so um, I, I've also stopped picking things up, uh, even though as a kid, I did it all the time. And Me too. <laughs> uh, right, like, but now that I have an awareness of what it can do, like, like we talked about chytrid fungus, if you pick up a frog or whatever that has been infected by this fungus, it's now on your paws. And then you go touch another one that didn't have it yet. You could be spreading that fungus. That's true. Um, also of why we think that bats got white, that white nose syndrome, which is a uh, fungus that was affecting them. Um, they thought that people going into different caves was spreading it. And so we have to be aware, not only of like, just like the chemicals on our bodies that get on the frog skin, um, but also like how our movements affect these animals. So that is, I'm so glad you brought that up. Thank you uh, for that advice. Um, before we wrap up, is there anything you want to plug? Anything you want to say? Where can we find you on social media? Tell us anything else that you want to say while you've got everybody's attention. Sure. So one thing that I wanted to say that you just reminded me of as far as macro photography being accessible. So a lot of the macro photography I do is just with my phone with a special clip on. So it's yeah. a little lens that you can buy online for 15 to 20 bucks. So, you know, still, you know, a bit of change, but more accessible to most people than these hundreds of dollars worth of macro lenses for DSLR cameras. Yeah. But don't let it hold you back that you don't have fancy equipment, that you don't have the nice camera if you want to be a photographer. Absolutely. 95% of the photos that I post online are with my phone. So I don't have access to, you know, more resources than the majority of people. So don't let that hold you back either. You can definitely be a great photographer with a very limited budget, very limited resources. All it takes is just curiosity, willingness to do the work, to get to know the wildlife around you, you know, put yourself where they're going to be, stuff like that. For sure, co-sign that for sure. Most of my photography is also with my phone. Um, I only recently started getting into the fancier stuff, but I'm 32 and an adult and all that. So uh, cool, um, great. Gina, thank you for taking the time to talk with us. This was really cool. I learned a lot. I hope everybody at home learned a lot too. Um, if you want to share this later uh, with folks, you can. it'll be posted probably tomorrow on youtube.com slash Skype a Scientist. If you appreciate the work that we're doing here, you can always support our program at patreon.com slash Skype a Scientist. We are a super grassroots nonprofit um, that's pretty scrappy. So every bit of support that you can give us is, is really, really appreciated. Um, Gina, oh, where can we find you on social media? Oh, thank you. Yes. Sorry. I do most of my social media posting on Twitter and that's at Gina goes outside. So no numbers, no nothing. Just Gina goes outside. That is what I do. Awesome. And, uh, Gina is a great follow. So you should definitely check that Twitter out. Um, Erin, thank you for signing for us today. And always, um, also I like your shirt today. It's a very pretty color. Um, and 
that's it, everyone. So if you uh, check out our website for more uh, details on future sessions that you can click the events tab. Um, thank you for joining us and we'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Have a great one. Thank you. Bye.